Hello and welcome to Stage Perspective. My name is Charles Peters and with us today, our very special guest is Mr. Brian Kelly. How are you? I'm well. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Good. As I was saying, you know, how are you doing it has to be met with a caveat. I think there's always got to be sort of under the circumstances, you know. Sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, very well. Thank you. You're not in a bell tower, so, you know, everything's good. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, I didn't mean to get real dark all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> Now, Brian, I wanted to have you on, first of all, because you and I spent a lot of time together on stage in uh, mm. various locations, um, and uh, also that you just had quite a career of various different things that you've done, and uh, I know that you uh, just love performing, and you have a lot of great stories, and I, I wanted to uh, talk to you about how you got started. How did you get started in performing? Do you know, like, the first time you stepped on stage? I do. Well, I mean, prof are we talking professionally? Because, like, I mean, you know, high school plays, things like that. But did you start? Did you start in high school? Did you do plays? I, well, I did. School? I did. Um, and, in fact, I have the distinction <laughs> of being the first person to say the word shit on the Edina <laughs> High School stage. Lovely. I had a, it was a Jabberwocky and I played the old man and they tell him that it's armistice and the war is over. And he says, armistice, shit. And that was. Is that in the script? It's in the script and they, oh, and they, they, they gave me the go ahead to do it. I'm sure now it's, it would be very no. tame, but at the time it was. You had a teacher that thought it was funny <laughs> trying to see yes, some of the well. ads. Yeah, exactly. Probably. So, uh, but uh, I went to college for uh, broadcast journalism with a minor in advertising and public relations. And I, uh, I'm not a hundred percent sure where I was going to go with any of that. But in the meantime, uh, you know, I graduated and uh, moved back to Minneapolis and an old friend of mine from high school was performing with comedy sports. And he said, you know, they're holding auditions and you're funny. I was like, well, funny is one thing, but I mean, on stage, I'm not, I don't do any stage stuff and whatever. And it, it was one of those things where, you know, I got on and, and so much of what improv is, is play. And, you know, I, I love games. I love, you know, trivia. I love charades. I love all these things. And so I just jumped in and, and started playing and, uh, you know, had, a, had a, a talent for it and had a, certainly had a love for it. And uh, it was the inadvertent uh, career <laughs> trajectory you know because i didn't study i didn't study theater at all in school at all i mean you did no. you did plays in, in high school and and that sort right. of thing right yeah right it were but you had no designs on being like oh i want to be an actor because a lot of people they they're you know they're like 10 or 11 years old they see something and they go oh that's what i want to do i want to be an actor yeah. that's me i want to be right. an actor for the rest of my life so right yeah. I, and and that's that's a funny thing because i never had any designs on being an actor and i still uh you know, the word actor always kind of gives me a little pause. And, and I know, and it's been explained to me a thousand times, but you know, again, I didn't study acting. I didn't, you know, uh, I just like entertaining people and making people laugh. And so I kind of, you know, I was like, well, I'm a prof professional goofball. I'm a clown. I'm a dad. Da, da, da. And at some point, you know, in your, if, if you keep doing it, uh, somebody's going to say, you know what you're doing, you are acting. So yeah. and just, just so you know, right. Um, but, but it felt a little aw shucks or somebody's going to find me out or, or something like that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, but that's okay. I mean, uh, because your natural ability to deliver a line, uh, believably and, and comedically, I mean, you may not describe yourself as an actor, but I think of you as an actor and, and a comedian. I mean, if I had to like put the label underneath you, not to pinpoint like, put you yeah. in a box but would you describe yourself that way would you say i'm a comedian or i'm an actor comedian or comedian yeah, i think actor? i think comedic actor because it yeah. kind of it at least it at least <laughs> signals to people you know this is where my strengths lie right i'll tell you a, a funny little story if, if you want uh a friend of mine cast me in 12 angry men and uh 
and he cast me as juror number four. And if you know the, the movie, uh, that's Edward G. Robinson's character. And the character mm-hmm. is as straight as can possibly be. There is nothing funny, yeah. nothing. I mean, there's nothing, not even a, not even a, a moment of like, Oh, he's so serious that it's funny. There's nothing funny about this guy. Right. Mm-hmm. And I'm asking my friend who the director, I'm like, are, did you, are you sure you didn't want me in the, the Jack Weston role or the, da, da, da? and he's like, no, 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 I want you here. So I'm like, okay. And, uh, and it was really kind of scary because for me, it's like, if they're laughing, I know where I stand, but, when I'm just doing the lines and there's no real response, it's, it's a little, you know, it's a trust exercise. Well, so one night we're doing the show and, um, and I deliver my line and from the audience, I hear this woman go, Pfft. I'm like, Ooh, geez, she, she didn't, she wasn't buying what I was throwing down. And then I, you know, another line came and I just hear, Pfft. I was like, Oh my God, she hates me. And three more times just, Every time I would deliver line, <laughs> turns out what I found out was it was a woman with a breathing apparatus and the thing would release a little every 10 minutes. It just happened to fall on my line. But, but for that time I was like flop sweat and like, God, I'm not an actor. So, <laughs> I remember that happening. They at Horton. Know. <laughs> yeah. At Horton grand, they would, I would hear that sound and I was like, what the hell is that? And I yeah. finally figured it out. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's funny. I remember, I remember that was in 2000, like 2010 or so, right? Like 2011. Oh, was it then? Memory. Um, uh, the reason I know is because you were talking about it when we were in Pittsburgh, I think. And okay. Maybe I have that wrong. I don't know. But. No, you're probably right. Uh, yeah, no, actually, it would be around that time. Good memory. Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't even uh, remember what I was. <laughs> yeah. uh, so from, uh, the other thing about you that I wanted to say that is is really remarkable is that you have a you have a really fast wit, which obviously serves you well in improv, and you have a encyclopedia catalog of <laughs> of film knowledge and pop culture references yeah. uh, that you can go to. So, and that's I mean I think that's a valuable thing. You you keep up on that, or at least you 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 have that backlog of, you know, films and TV and old movies and all that thing. So, yeah, well, you know, some of it I think is a product of, I mean, cause like you and I are not dissimilar in age. I'm, I'm sure I'm older, but I don't know by how much I don't, I don't think about, about it, but, um, but I think people my age, especially like, like the, 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 the generation just ahead of me or, you know, the decade ahead of me, yeah. so like Bill Arnold, for example, yeah. uh, who's a friend of ours from triple espresso. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was of the sort of like, you know, you see it once on TV and then you move on and you go play outside, but I was the rerun generation and there's three TV channels and I just think that I'm like of that generation who would sit down into an episode of Gilligan's Island and say, oh, it's the one with the, you know, the pigeon and the spider. Mm-hmm. I love this episode. And then proceed to watch it again. Right. And like, it just reaffirmed, uh, you know, yeah. that's why we, we ha- have the entirety of Star Wars memorized. That's why, because we've seen it a thousand times. But now there's so much. So it's like, before that, it was like, why would you watch something a second time? Yeah. And now there's just so much content that like, nobody rewatches anything. So I'm just of that, that age where it's just completely, yeah. And I think with that also is that it becomes, because of that repeat viewing, because the rerun generation, if you were an actor or a comedian, you had a tendency, and I've watched interviews with comedians, is you have a tendency to, that becomes inherent. It starts to seek seep into your system so that you now use it as a, a callback when you're putting stuff together you go this is just like this moment it's not i'm not copying that but this you is exactly the same right. timing and i know this works because i've seen it work and so you can mm-hmm. reference things that way and i use that in yeah. acting and i directed a show called baskerville which is a sherlock holmes comedy and i pulled i pulled out as many stops as i could mm-hmm. and and did stuff that was not in the script i threw everything into that to make it you know funnier and funnier and it, it all came from that that kind of yeah. thing so yeah well whether it's uh just sort of a repeated viewing gives you an understanding of like, you know, how timing works and, you know, cause I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm only 51. So I'm not, you know, ancient, but I'm like the only person that I know who owns every episode of the Phil Silver show on DVD, you know? Um, 
because I, I, I used to watch that like oh, all my God. the time. I used to that watch that thing. Still, still holds. Show. Still holds up. It you does. know, I mean, at least as a, mm-hmm. as a as a baseline. I mean, you know, and and you you do you you you're right. You'll be writing something. And you'll be like, oh, I know, I know what kind of joke needs to go here. And it's not exactly copying the joke, but it's like, I know that kind of rhythm. I know right. that kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, or like, for example, I was writing a, a Christmas show and I, and I included a, uh, uh, a, this ridiculous knife throwing routine uh, in it, which I love when you write yourself into a corner where it's like, oh, well, now I got to <laughs> come up with a knife throwing routine uh, or a, a prop, you know, but um, but I remembered uh, the old Lucy show, yep. uh, the I Love Lucy, where she had the, they had the board, you know, and you knew how it was done, but you're watching it happen. Was it Orson Welles doing that? Ooh, was that no. somebody, was it somebody else? It was I don't else remember. It doesn't matter. Right. I was just curious. It doesn't matter. <laughs> But, you know, but things like that where it's like, oh, you know what would work here is this right. thing that, yeah, it, it yep. you know, and that's yeah. totally, I think that's totally valid. And that's not like lifting, lifting. No, jokes, it's not. It's, it's, it's just, it's using that principle. I mean, I was in magic for a long time and magic is really just a series of principles that you explore and you put together. It's like Lego pieces. Yeah. <laughs> so to well, speak. I, I watched, uh, we, we watched, um, uh, oh gosh, what's it called now? Uh, Oh, geez, the the uh, Andy Samberg movie that's just oh. out. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't help you there. Ah, this is killing me. <laughs> Palm Springs. Palm oh, Springs. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Right. Which the premise is effectively Groundhog's Day. Right. And mm-hmm. you go, well, gee, that seems like kind of a, you know, kind of a cheap lift, but uh, but it takes it in such a different direction, and it's really inter- I loved it. I thought it was great, and I didn't think I was going to like it because I was like, eh, that seems derivative but it was very, very enjoyable because it's what, you know, you can be original while still using, like you say, the Lego pieces to kind of, right. you know. So before we move forward, because you're now doing comedy sports, we were talking about that, but you also played a very iconic character for a while. I don't know. Can you talk about that? Uh, oh, with make, with that makeup, character. That character. Can you talk about that? Are you allowed to talk about that? I mean, I signed something once upon a time. Are All I'll say is that, uh, you know, I, I had some big shoes to fill. Right. Um, and I worked for a, uh, an organization that uh, is known for their philanthropy, having a, a house for, for uh, families of uh, kids who are sick. Maybe that gives a hint. But yeah, um, but I, I, I played that character for a while. Mm-hmm. Actually, I was more on the writing side. We were doing uh, children's shows. Um, yeah which unfortunately they've, they've canceled that program nationwide. And it's, it's, it's kind of a shame because uh, it was at least what we were doing was, was getting real, <laughs> real response from, from the schools. We were, we were trying to do uh, non uh, um, non-curriculum social uh, things, which, yeah. and this we're talking about, this is like late nineties, early two thousands when I was doing it. So we were doing things like bullying and, uh, you know, pillars of character and stuff like that kind of before it became, you know, the, the buzzword that it is right now. Right. Um, uh, but, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So I wrote those shows, but I was kind of, I was kind of third man on the, you were you know, called if, several times to play that character. Right. Oh yeah. Like, and, you know, if, if it's the 4th yeah. of July, every, it's all hands on deck. Every, right. every yeah. clown in town. As right. It were. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but. exactly. So from comedy sports, did comedy sports lead you directly to, triple espresso is that the no the it's line? The, well it's, here's the weird thing about that so uh what comedy sports did was uh just introduced me to some other funny people and and other funny people introduced me to other funny people and eventually uh the owner of the mystery cafe and i met in a bar <laughs> and we're both a little tipsy and uh, a friend of mine says hey you should meet brian he's funny and he turns and he says you know, I'm doing a, I'm casting a new show now, you know, I'm looking for a big guy. You're a big guy. Uh, you want to audition? I said, sure. And he says, this is the nineties. He says, uh, he says, well, well, can you, why don't you uh, come on your lunch break tomorrow? I was like, well, I, I don't have a car. And he goes, all right, well, well, I'll come to you. And so he drove downtown to, I was working in the box office of a theater and, uh, you know, we went up to the second floor and I auditioned for him at my job. And I don't know what director would ever come to, 
<laughs> you know, to audition somebody, but he did. And uh, I started doing Mystery Cafe, and that kind of led to Tony and Tina's. But Triple Espresso was different because uh, Johnny Bush, who you know very well, yes. uh, he and I went to high school together. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, and so yeah. John Bush, for those of you who don't know who that is, he played uh, one of the characters in Triple Espresso, the show that Charles and I did together. And he knew that they were hiring and recommended me. Now, for years, John had a very st successful stand-up career, but I never saw his act. And he knew that I was doing comedy sports, and he'd never come to see me. So we only really knew each other from high school. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, you, you don't know that I'm any good now. I mean, right. you better hope you recommended me. <laughs> you better hope I got better. Cause if all I'm, all you're going off of is what we did in high school. That's not that's funny. <laughs> Was he already doing triple espresso yeah, at that time? Yeah. 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 And just to point out to people that don't know this show, cause I've talked about this a couple of times, triple espresso was written by three guys in Minneapolis, which is where you're based right now. You're in, yeah. in Minneapolis. Um, and they started in a very small theater called the cricket theater. And it broke all box office records and there they put it on at the last part of the season and they couldn't shut it down and they rewrote the show into a full scale show and it just took off and it played in minneapolis for 12 years mm -hmm. it played here in san diego for almost 11 years and it was in 50 cities worldwide so it went to canada it went to germany and was translated into belgium uh, it went to Berlin. It went to London. It was in Ireland at least six times. One of those was a tour around Ireland, not just mm -hmm. in Dublin, and all across the United States. So it was a huge hit. The reason people don't know it, I always say, is because it was never published. Like uh, Jersey Boys is published. Uh, and and uh, what else? The uh, uh, Forever Plaid is a published mm -hmm. work. So that's why people know it, because everybody can do it. And Triple right. Espresso is still owned by the company, so they can't. They, yeah, they made the decision early on that they wanted uh, involvement, and so yeah. everything had to come out of Minneapolis. All the casting, um, you know, all the direction, all that stuff. They weren't gonna. They weren't gonna sell the script off to uh, somebody and say, "Okay, you you do it." Because right. they were they were very specific about it, yeah. and I, I respect that. I I think that I think between it, they did it did not work. I think there was like one or two times it's, they tried to get somebody else to do it and it was really yeah. not what they well, wanted. You, so. you know, you know very well, it's a very specific kind of show. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of, for, for something that's just dumb, broad comedy. Right. And it is, it's dumb, broad comedy, mm -hmm. but, yeah. but if you don't have certain elements, you know, that involve uh, likability of characters, mm -hmm. um, chemistry between the characters, then you don't, you don't care. And it yeah. really can go south, you yeah. know, fast. Yeah. But it's a great show. It's a great yeah. show. Did you know, I don't know if you knew this. Uh, I was just talking to uh, Michael Pierce Donnelly, who's one of the, uh, the, the uh, original writers of Triple Espresso. Mm -hmm. And I had gotten to see the script, the original script, mm. which is 13 pages long. Right. And it's like a little bit of dialogue. And then it says, uh, uh, Bob does his Montana bit. Yeah. And then a little bit of dialogue and then Bill does his magic act. And then, you know, Michael sings a song or whatever. And, and uh, they didn't have their character names at that point. They were using their original names, which I think was very interesting mm. because yeah. the characters aren't all a hundred percent likable <laughs> all the time. And so they are kind of owning their own personality traits, which I think is hilarious, but that's funny. Yeah. I do remember that the script was very, very short. And uh, yeah, it reminds me of the Dick Van Dyke show where they just would, towards the end, they would just write, uh, Rob uh, plays with guns and they would let him right. figure it out. They didn't write anything. They just, and that was supposed to be five minutes of the show. And so it's oh. like, okay. Uh, yeah. So you did Triple Espresso uh, for the, you did a number of cities I and mean, you were in Minneapolis yeah. a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and, and the other thing I didn't mention is that this show at one time, the reason so many people were connected with it is that they had seven productions running simultaneously well, at one time. Gonna. What's that? They were gonna. They were gonna? What do you mean? Well, I don't know that, I don't know that it actually happened. They, they had gotten into bed with some organization that I think was setting up these, these tours and there were a mm. lot of cities and then something went sour because I do remember there was a time when we had more actors than we did uh, 
Yeah, that's true too. But I know at yeah. one time there was at least like five cities that were running at the same time because you had Minneapolis and San Diego, and then yep. you had like three other cities running. So yeah, uh, simultaneously. So at the same, that's what I was. Yeah, well, because Des Moines, Des Moines went for a very good, good long time. Yeah, that went for um, at least a year. I know that. Yeah. But, uh, so what are your so what are your favorite? The other thing you were talking about is having that the characters work and part of what made that really work was having there were three characters in the show is having those three guys work together and yeah. and if you didn't have three guys that knew how to work together that's when the show felt clunky or disjointed but when you had three guys that knew how to work together that was a beautiful thing so it was a yeah. great great fun well uh, so your character for example you, i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt Did no you know? no that was it okay. i was done because <laughs> yeah well because your character was very uh deadpan uh, yes the way bill plays it it's kind of bob newhart-esque it's that but it's mm -hmm. very very straight and very deadpan right and uh my character is uh you know as they're talking about the lack of success and whose fault it was he has a sort of a built-in um uh <laughs> he's painting it the way he remembers it. Right. But it's not a hundred percent sincere. Yeah. You know? And so the other character who's kind of this mediator, a piano player named Hugh Butternut, if he isn't um, real and approachable and yeah. likable, then you've got nobody offering any kind of honesty yeah. and it just gets the sheen over it. And now it's just kind of a vaudeville piece yeah. as opposed to something that's more about the characters. And so, right. I, th and that role weirdly is, is kind of the unsung, you know, hero of the, of the relationship. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. But fortunately we had a lot of guys who were really, really capable of that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and a lot of guys that weren't <laughs> <laughs> a couple, I've, there were I mean, a couple that just didn't, didn't get it. Wanted yeah. it to be something more than what it was. And it's yeah. like, that's not the show we're doing. Uh, well, uh, that's, that's a great just, idea, but yeah. we're not doing that show. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just it is, is, you know, it gets to be a challenge because yeah. if it, it gets to be a challenge, if it's, if you want the role to be something other than what it is, because like the, the magicians, uh, a couple of them struggled with, the less is more concept. And yeah. absolutely, as you well know, the less is so much more, oh, but, yeah. but it doesn't get, but other people wanted to act and they wanted yeah. to be demonstrative yeah. and it, it, it's, it, it could work, but it just wouldn't work yeah. quite as, quite as well. And I think when you got to bump out the parameters in order to do what it is you want to do, then you're kind of, you know, yeah. The redemption for me was always an act too, being able to do the cups and balls, everything else up to them as far as the magic, you know, as far as like from a magician standpoint, you know, you yeah. had to actually kind of make yourself look like a bad magician, even though you're actually doing stuff in the first act. But right. the redemption was always the cups and balls is like the evolution. So it's like, Oh God, Oh, this guy actually knows what he's doing. So, right. um, yeah. But at any rate, um, so tell me you did, 2000 close to 2000 performances yeah it was like 1762 <laughs> yeah. or something like and, that and when i when i first when i first oh, started I bill, said, bill arnold yeah. said you know you don't start to get it until about the 50th show so i started counting and then i never stopped counting so i actually yeah. do have it written down somewhere oh that's great huh. what so. are some of the cities you worked uh let's see i did uh, obviously minneapolis san diego cincinnati sacramento uh cleveland um, uh, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, which I loved, uh, Dublin twice. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like there were others. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that leap to mind. Yeah, yeah that's right. I did one night in Detroit. <laughs> I think, uh, Joe Gaucher got sick one night and I yeah. came in. They were close. Did you ever go to Tucson or Phoenix? Oh yeah, I did Phoenix. Yeah. Phoenix I thought you great. did. I yeah. thought you did Phoenix. Yeah, yeah. I'd forgotten about that one. Yeah. Uh, I didn't do, I didn't do, uh, is it Tulsa you said? Tulsa, yeah. Tulsa. Yeah. I didn't do Tulsa, didn't do Green yeah. Bay. Oh, I did Des Moines uh, yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. That's great. Do you have a favorite moment from that show that you can share? I'm sure you have many, but like a. You, you know, mean as far as give, uh, give me, something I do in the show? Yeah, just like on stage well, that you have shadow a, puppets. It, shadow sh puppets. Yeah. So there's a I scene mean, where you do shadow actually do shadow puppets. Yeah. And it's a, it's a funny routine, but it's also a skillful routine. So yeah. And, and that's that's what I that's what I like about it. And and 
I mean, it, it was the thing in the show. And, and it's also a, a very, it's, it's the only point in the show, you know, it, it, the, re, the whole place is dark and it has to be absolutely pitch black in order to, you know, do the shadows. So the only thing you see is this circle of light, you yeah. know, and it's so different from everything else in the show, which is brightly colored and mm-hmm. lots of lighting and we had great mm-hmm. lighting design and all that. Yep. Um, but in this moment, it's just this laser focused thing and you know that all eyes are on it yeah. and it's little subtle things. It's like the bunny rabbit. It's like the, right. you know, and you're doing these tiny little things that are amplified by the, by the screen. And I don't know what it is, but like not being able to see the audience and just hearing those waves of laughter. I remember in yes. Dublin, like hearing stomping. Uh, yes. in the bleachers that, yeah. because people were laughing so hard. Right. Um, and th- again, that's, that's one of those things where uh, Bob Stromberg created the piece and we were fortunate enough to be uh, handed it and yeah. could had the opportunity to make it our own because it is such a question of little tiny nuances. Uh, John Bush, who we mentioned before, he used to be very, very jealous of my bunny. <laughs> He'd come in and be like, God, your bunny is so good. Yeah. I wish I could... You know, funny. Yeah, your your hand shadows were really good. Not everybody did really well at them. They would be a little sloppy, and everybody kind of brought something to that piece. Any of the pieces that were the performance pieces were uh, embellished a little bit by the particular performer's personality, which is what made yeah. the show fun to watch. But isn't that sort of at the heart of comedy yes. anyway? Is like. Yes. In some cases, it's about specificity, and in some cases, it's about, you know, a looseness. Right. And there isn't a right or wrong answer. Uh, right. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, but, there, were, yeah. there were times in the show where you felt like you were being pushed on. I felt like, you know, it's like, no, to do it this way. And it's like, yeah, but that's not me i you're forcing me to do this particular thing this way so it was hard it was a very it was hard to bend to it was like putting on shoes that were just a little tight you know yeah. sometimes yeah not all the time not all the time but i mean there were times when it felt like that where it was like ah, oh, i just you know i i looked at it like first of all you know having done improv or at least or interactive theater where half of it's improv you know and half of it's scripted mm-hmm. or whatever um I've always been under directed where the expectation is that you as the comedic actor are going to bring the thing, you know, and just, just deliver it. There's not a lot of direction. So with triple espresso, I mean, it was, it, as you know, it, it was a month of all day uh, rehearsals and then watching the show at night. Yeah. Uh, and really just kind of, cause they were very specific uh, about what they, what they wanted. And I thought of like, you know, when you're doing a TV commercial, right? And they're like, we're doing a close up here. You can only move from here to here. Mm-hmm. You know, you may want to do a big take, but then if you do, you're out of frame. Right. So I just kind of thought of it like, well, they want, you know, they don't want here. They want here. Okay. Right. I'll give them that. Yeah. And that's, that's a good ass assertion of, of what it was as well. It was, I never felt like I was put upon because I was, it came in a point in my life when I needed it. I mean, it got me back into performing. I was ready to be done. And, and I was, it was a real gift to me. I, I remember actually getting weepy when I checked into my uh, corporate housing in Minneapolis for the first time. It was like, cause I had essentially been, you know, not homeless, but I didn't have a place to stay. So yeah. uh, it was really, well, I had really been, wonderful. I had been weepy. i had been weepy before I met you because, <laughs> well, Bill had told me, uh, you know, kind of your your story oh, yeah. and and, and yeah. we knew i knew you were coming to town i was like i can't wait to i want to give this guy a hug yeah. already i don't yeah. know yeah. i don't even know him but yeah and we uh we had a great time that summer uh doing that show was really wonderful what's your worst without uh casting any bad light on anybody <laughs> what's your what's your worst moment like i uh okay well, no, person, i can do this because we have we all have great like oh this was great and this was, i have a worst moment that I had in Tulsa, uh, mm. the, which is very simple. I had the cards for the pigs the wrong way, and they were, oh. I would pull them out, and uh, th- they were blank. The audience was blank to them. They were just seeing white pieces of paper. So, oh, I, so they're <laughs> that's like, kind of funny in and of itself. <laughs> I'm like, why aren't they laughing at this? 
And I did oh, it yeah, three times. Oh, yeah. And it's like, you're supposed to get name a farm animal and then you pull out a pig and there's a bunch of jokes right. that go with it. Each one is a pig. And, and, uh, and then there's a, <laughs> there's a payoff. They were turned around the wrong way and I didn't notice it. And I, I was early doing the show and I pulled them out and I'm like, wow, those lights are really bright. I can actually see the pig through the paper. And I didn't realize we were uh, backwards. It wasn't until I got off stage and they told me. And, and no wonder they weren't laughing at that bit. <laughs> speak, speaking of that, so so you know the bit that, that the magician does where uh, uh, he does the, the torn and restored newspaper. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. And then to kind of undermine it, he puts it away and then pulls out a bunch of the ripped paper and right, exactly. kind of exposes that that was a, right. And then later, there's another one coming out of the sleeve and right. another one coming out of the other yeah. sleeve. Uh-huh. Well, Christopher Hart, one night, <laughs> forgot to do the, to the tor Tear and Restore newspaper. And so when it came time to pull the stuff out, he did that, but he hadn't done the bit in the first place to set it up. And so he keeps pulling out pieces of paper, and the audience is like, I don't know why he's pulling out pieces of paper at random. And he's at the, at the intermission, he's like, why weren't they laughing? And I'm like, because you didn't do the damn trick. <laughs> um, but for me, uh, if you're asking me about, about my... I think you know this one because um, yeah. someone very close to you had an involvement in it. Um, now this is not to say because every actor should check uh, actors out there, check your props. Yes. Okay? Maybe stage managers will place them for you, right. but you should always make sure to check your props before the show. That's on you. Okay. So <laughs> having said that, she, the stage manager did not <laughs> place my guitar. Uh, and uh, there's this bit where uh, my character is leading a, uh, a, a college freshman orientation, but he's acting like he's doing a kindergarten class and it's ridiculous. But so much of it involves the guitar. The guitar has a mirror on it. And when I'm like talking to people in the audience, I'm shining this light directly on their faces. Uh, and because I'm playing the guitar, I bring out these cards to flip to show what the lyrics are. And because I'm playing the guitar, I can't also flip. That's what prompts me to bring an audience member up. Well, there's no guitar. So I go out there and I'm leading a sing along just like this and like, you know, pointing and whatever. And I feel completely naked because ordinarily I've got this prop that is so, you know, uh, when I'm talking to the person, I can't shine the light on them. So I'm going to somebody very specifically in the front row, uh, making sure that everybody knows who I'm talking to. And then when it came time for the cards, I just kind of pretended that, Oh, I just really don't want to. I'll just bring a guy up. Um, but after it was so funny because afterwards, uh, I, I go backstage and I mean, it's all flop sweat and all this stuff. And at the intermission, I run into JT and she was so hangdog. She was like, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I'm so sorry. But it, it, it actually worked out just fine. And, and it's so funny what audiences won't catch if they don't know any yeah. better. Yeah. But to us, it's like, that was a disaster. Yeah. It actually was yeah. fine. Yeah. It gave you perspective, basically, is the way you described it. It, it gave me perspective to always check my props, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. That's, that's... There you go. I, uh, uh, from, now, I know that you also, when Triple Espresso sort of, it didn't end and it sort oh. of sort of faded to a trickle <laughs> this is well kind of but this is this is actually the first year that uh that they're not doing uh the holiday season right they, they always done the holiday yeah. season but they kind of closed down san diego and the other shows kind of stopped and tours stopped and they were still going and doing little things and then the minneapolis had closed down uh, a little long not long after that or whatever around that time and yep. now they they moved and they came back and so they were they were continuing to do the holiday run which was like november through january yeah. that sort of thing and uh, that's but, most theaters in minnesota it's mm -hmm. hard to maintain all year yeah. round yeah but i mean for having a almost 12 year run in minneapolis that's pretty impressive oh, yeah. and yeah. and it was such a staple but uh so after that I know that you started getting into like doing some theater. You did a lot of plays. I know you talked about doing uh, 12 Angry Men and yep. you, you did some other plays as well, didn't you? There, there was a year there where I said, I want to, um, I just want to open myself up to doing other kinds of things and make myself available to do that. Uh, the year after that, I said, this is the year I'm going to learn how to vet things <laughs> because I had a year where I did some pretty terrible shows. Uh, 
and that uh, never feels good. I did a production of the Fantastics that was less than fantastic. I'll just put that <laughs> Who'd one. you play in the Fantastics? Okay, I'll. Do you want to guess? Uh, I'm imagining that you played. Is it? I, it's been a while since I've seen it. Um, I actually did props for it. Um, the uh, the. Are you like the storyteller, the magician, or the guy See, that comes that's, in? Well, I El Gallo. El Gallo. El Gallo. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Well, yeah, but I, but I'm surprised you would you would select that because you know, to me, being the age and the weight that I am, I would have thought like the father or you know mm. whatever. But what I realized was, so we get to um, we get to the table read for it and I just accepted because I, I had done uh, Sisters of Swing and somebody the director had seen me in that and she liked she, she's like oh I just really enjoyed you would you like to I didn't have to audition I'm like it's nice to be asked sure oh, what yeah, the heck I'll yeah. do it so I get there to the table read and it's like uh, the uh, I'm trying to decide how to how to say this without being you know stereotypical or whatever but I guess the point of the story is exactly this is that like you know one of the fathers was a woman uh, the, uh, the, uh, male, uh, uh, ingenue or whatever, you know, very, very gay. Um, the, the mute was the most talkative woman I've ever known in my life. She's a good friend. Uh, it, and I realized as I'm sitting there, I'm like, oh, they're casting against type like intention, like every character is against right. type. Yeah. And when you think of what the role of El Gallo is, he is dashing he is the uh, the the competition for the for the the female you know as a as a paramour, uh, you, you know he's he's all these things that are like you know attractive and you know da da da, and I'm like if they're casting against type, what is that saying about, <laughs> right now, I'm about saying me? <laughs> yeah. And and it was a weird production anyway, um, but it it didn't feel very good. And 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 the only thing I could do was to in my mind was just to, to say okay well, I'm just going to play dashing and I'm going to play this. And, you know, huh. I got, I wasn't it. even thinking that I was thinking, yeah, I could see you really playing the role just as it's, as it's supposed to be. So not against, oh, type. Well, so I appreciate yeah. that. I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't know. So, um, so you did, you did the fantastics. Are there any other plays that you did around that? Because I know it was like a collection of like, you did, you did a bunch yeah. of theater at that point. Cause you were just I like, I want to open myself yeah. up to that. I did. Well, you remember we were talking about specificity. I did. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what is it? Accidental death of an anarchist or some, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, yeah. And uh, it was a. It's a, an Italian farce, and it's very political. And so you have to make adjustments politically within the script to kind of fill in the blanks of like what's going on politically now, ish. You know. Yeah. Um, but also, it's it was a, a farce and a farce has to be very, very specific. It's oh, physical yeah. comedy. It's all. And the direction was very not specific. In fact, there was a character that doesn't have any lines and this particular actor couldn't make it to most of the rehearsals. And so we're rehearsing this. Sh I know I'm, I'm going to tell you this and you're going to be <laughs> mad. You're going to be literally mad where we rehearse this show. And in the last two days, this guy comes in and the director said, I want you to find bits to do. And so he would just be walking around this office. It's all takes place in a police office station, whatever. And he'll walk over to the whiteboard behind us and start drawing a penis or something, you know, like while we're talking and doing what we had already rehearsed. And there was supposedly funny in the, what we're doing, but here's this competition. Or at one point he went over to it. There's a coffee maker and just started grinding like coffee while I'm talking. And then there was another time where I have a line to deliver to him. And one time he was over on this side of the stage and the other time he's over on the other side of the stage. And I asked the question, I'm like, say, where is he going to be? Just so I know where to deliver my line. And the director said, wherever he wants. Uh, so it's, it's not so much. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was one of those shows where, you know, if somebody you knew, came, you didn't tell anybody. And if somebody you knew came, you go up to him afterwards and go, hey, thanks so much for, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I am so sorry. Right. There's shows that you ask people to come to and then there's shows that you just, oh, they're yeah. there, they're there, you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, yeah. Now you wrote a show too um, called The oh, Temp, yeah. correct? Yes. Yeah. And it was, uh, it kind of started, I remember watching a, a video of like a really early production and I go, you should like 
write this. You should do more. And then you, you did and you like, you, I'm sure I wasn't the only person that said that to you, but you took it and made it into like a full length play and it ran in some places, didn't it? You uh, ran well, it in many, yeah, ran I mean, Minneapolis so, and then somebody else did it out of town. Uh, somebody did it in Green Bay and right. uh, a college group did it in, uh, yeah. uh, outside of, outside of Cleveland. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, it was a, it was an interesting thing because uh, it, it was a, a, a modest hit. It was the first show I'd ever written. It was a musical comedy uh, about a small, uh, based on a sketch, really. Yeah. The whole thing was just this Shane reference where, but it's this office, they fire this guy, now they need to fill the the hole and so they bring in a temp and the temp comes in and he's a cowboy straight out of the old west you know and he comes in to clean up the office and you know he has the romance with the top saleswoman and the you know it's and then he leaves like shane at the end he's like well it's not in the nature of a temp to stay in any one place for too long if i were to stay i wouldn't be a temp i'd be a perm I gotta go. And like, and he leaves and you know, it's just stupid, but, um, but there's also this, the guy who got fired kind of comes back to haunt us, but he has bad a phantom as he was an employee. So it's like putting sticky notes on the desk and changing people's passwords and stupid stuff like that. Um, anyway, it was a funny little show did, did very well in Minneapolis. Um, and I, I had always been told by people, uh, it's like, you know, you should build this up and into a thing. Yeah. yeah. And so I did, uh, and, and I, it was a really expensive lesson, but, uh, but it was a good one, which, which is to say that um, I actually put some money into it and uh, built a huge set, uh, rented a theater to run it in. Um, and was, that in was that in town? Was that in Minneapolis? It was actually, it was the music box, you know, oh, okay. it was because oh, okay. uh, Triple Espresso had just ended and, and mm -hmm. people were asking, well, what's next? And I was like, well, maybe my thing. Maybe the tenth. It was the tenth. It was the tenth anniversary. We got lots of publicity and all this stuff. Um, but what was interesting was so the first time we did it was this place called the Bryant Lake Bowl, which yeah. is a small theater, about a ninety-nine seat theater, <laughs> one more, and you know you're out the door, uh, in the back of a bowling alley. Huh. And you could actually they have big thick doors, but you can still hear like the bowling, you know. So it's got this tiny charm to it and i had a, a like an eight person cast on this small stage and i remember in the day when i rehearsed it i had mapped out with chalk like uh, this is going to be the performance area so get right. used to it and i mapped it out so that it was a foot shorter on all sides <laughs> so that when they got to the stage the actual stage they'd be like well this is spatial um, but you know, we had choreographed numbers and things and I, I had a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Lorna Landvik, who's an author and she does a lot of, uh, you know, one woman show type things. She said, mm -hmm. I, she, she said, I watched that show and I, I forgot where I was. I mean, I, you know, my one woman show feels crowded, feels crowded on that stage. I don't know how you did that. And so it was this thing of like, it's a parody of musical comedies. I mean, it, it references all kinds of musical comedies, Phantom and, and, you know, whatever else. Um, but it was great when it was bigger than the space yeah. you know when it was a parody of a real show right i would and I, I had been told it's like you if you really kind of and what i realized was i made it into a real show and it's not a real show yeah and that's that was that was a really great learning experience um mm. but that is interesting what advice yeah. would you give to somebody who is like uh, aspiring to write a play or a musical or something do you have any words of wisdom God, no. <laughs> Don't do it. I mean, you know, here in Minneapolis, it's, it's really great because there's lots of, you know, not, not at the moment, but there's lots of opportunities for, uh, for new talent mm -hmm. to, to, to thrive. We've got a uh, huge theater is our, uh, the hub of the improv community. Yeah. Lots of, lots of shows. They do yeah. when they're, when they're in operation, yeah. there's six shows a week, three sure. shows a night. Uh, there's yeah. places like the Bryant Lake Bowl where you're not renting the theater, you're splitting the house. Yeah. You know? yeah. Uh, but you have to pitch to them what your idea is and then they, they approve it. And, yeah. Wow. You know. That's or fantastic. for example, my, my company, uh, which uh, is the mystery cafe, which I had done for years and years. And then I bought the company uh, two years ago and uh, we work 
out, out of uh, different venues that, uh, you know, they do their own food service and such. And so they may, you know, we build the food into the ticket price and yeah. they make their money off of the, the yeah. beverages and the, we, we had the, one here in San Diego for years. Oh yeah. That's right. A, that was uh, part of the Imperial house and it was, they would serve full on dinner and they used the wait staff to serve. And then we served as characters, uh, mm -hmm. but they did all the cooking and everything. People gather yep. in the bar and then we bring them in. And it was like a, you know, like seating them in a restaurant. And uh, right. then we did the show. Uh, I did a season, which was great. Uh, yeah. But yeah, very similar deal. So, um, it, it, and that's the kind of thing where that's just, that's just, uh, you know, having the, the, the gumption to approach somebody and say, Hey, I've got this idea, you know, here's how it's beneficial to everybody involved and yeah. then just kind of build it up from there. And it's, it's totally possible. What prompted you to buy a mystery cafe? What was that? So I had, yeah, I've been doing, i had been doing mystery cafe since the mid nineties and, and I'll tell you, and I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the sound of it to a, I think to a theater person, it's like, Oh, dinner theater. Right. Oh, the actors are serving the, Oh God. It sounds like, you know, it sounds kind of dreadful. Um, and you assume that the shows probably aren't that great. But yeah. uh, the guy who created uh, the thing is just an incredibly talented, smart, savvy guy who really, really cared about the productions. And so we were doing stuff that was really high comedy. And, and I mean, not, <laughs> not high comedy in terms of like intellect, but yeah, we had really good people doing it, and who really, really worked out the you know the bits production, the production yeah, values, production. basically. Yeah. So, um, and the, the 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 layout of the thing just makes so much sense, and uh, and it was just a, it was a lot of fun to do, and I met a lot of great people who I still work with today, um, and still work for the Mystery Cafe, in fact. And so, um, uh, what had happened was I had been hired as the entertainment director for the St. Paul Saints. And for those of you who don't know what the St. Paul Saints are, they are the uh, independent baseball club here in Minneapolis owned by Mike Vec, son of Bill Vec, from the uh, owner of the Chicago White Sox back in the 70s. And Bill Murray, yes, that Bill Murray, uh, owned own the team. And uh, they're known for their shenanigans. And so uh, there's the baseball, and then in between each inning, there's some kind of crazy a race or a contest or a trivia thing or something on the field uh, to entertain. And so I was hired to uh, head up the entertainment team. And the first thing I did was to hire uh, the guy who owned the mystery cafe uh, for the PA because he knew baseball. So I knew he'd be able to, you know, call batters and that sort of thing. But he also has this big booming voice. <laughs> now batting. Hey, <laughs> Hanson. And like just this huge booming voice. Uh, and it was, uh, it was a great, <laughs> it was good casting, let's just say. So he and I were working together on the Saints for, uh, for a good couple of years there. And he was saying to me, he's like, you know, I just want to do something else. It's like, I've been doing Mystery Cafe for 28 years. Wow. You know, the company, the company was founded in 1989. It's actually the longest running interactive dinner theater in Minneapolis. Wow. Um, and I was kind of interested in, in doing more because uh, the Saints was was the first time I'd kind of taken over and you know produced uh, mm -hmm. acted as a producer you know yeah. and, and a director of, of a kind and I thought well here's a good opportunity to kind of just you know do my own thing produce yeah. direct and uh, write and so uh, we talked about it and I ended up buying the company so yeah and it's been fairly successful from what we've talked about. I mean, it's, you've had it's been great, you know, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously we're in a bit of a, a sticky place right now, but yeah. uh, I'm assuming your goal is to continue with that after this and, yeah. and, and make that, uh, make that go. So, yeah. Yeah. We had had, um, we have uh, a venue in uh, Ham Lake, which is a suburb here. Mm -hmm. um, that is uh, we've, we've been there. This, this would have been our 10th year. Wow. Uh, so we're going to celebrate our 10th anniversary, you know, on our 11th anniversary hmm. uh, and just make a, make a bit out of it. Um, <laughs> so we always have a brand new show there. Every year I write a brand new show. Uh, last year I actually wrote two new shows. Uh, one was called Alma Murder, which is an all-class high school reunion themed show. Right. And then the other one was called I'll Be Homicidal for Christmas, which <laughs> is, uh, it takes place on the set of a 70s holiday variety show. That's great. Uh, 
and uh, and we've always got our corporate show and other things right. going on. Yeah. So, uh, what are some of your influences as far as like films or uh, television? We talked earlier about Bill, and uh, I know Bob Newhart was and it was a big influence for him because that's yeah. kind of his style. Even the act that he does. Uh, that he originally did in Triple Espresso that transferred into the show and then eventually became Everyone's Act is really patterned after that. Uh, yeah. That sort of style. It's as if Bob Newhart did a magic act, yeah. essentially. Uh, so who are some of your influences? Uh, I'm going to answer that question, but I want to just interject one thing because of the Bob Newhart connection. Yeah. Bill Daly, uh, who played um, uh, Howard, Howard Borden, yeah. the next door yeah. neighbor on the right. Newhart show, actually got to see Bill do Triple Espresso in uh, um, where were we? Albuquerque, which I also forgot about Albuquerque. Yeah, Albuquerque. Um, should have taken a left at Albuquerque. But anyways, uh, uh, see, he he got to see the show, and he was like, "Oh, you just were." It was Bob Newhart. It was right up there, and he was oh, it was really cool. Yeah. But Bill Bill could have died in that in that moment, you know. Um, but my influences, the, the, I will say it, and you will chuckle, uh, but uh, Jim Henson and the Muppets are the first, yeah. the first yeah. influence, uh, my first creative hero. And I, I've, I've told people when we're doing Mystery Cafe, I'm like, if you think I'm trying to do anything other than recreate the Muppet show, you're, you're out of your mind. Yeah. Um, you know, because I guess it was, you know, it was vaudeville what they were doing. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. It was musical numbers and it was just, you know, big, big recognizable characters that you either, you know, that, that all had such different, like they shouldn't have all gotten along, but they're all a family, mm -hmm. you know, I love that. I love that. Absolutely. And so that's, I, that's built in a lot to like what I, what I try to do um, as well as, you know, I don't really consciously think about, you know, clean comedy versus, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. What I've always said is I just try to do stuff that's not mean spirited, you know, and triple espresso is a good example of that too. It's a very clean show and it's not really mean spirited at all. It's very, yeah. yeah you don't want to, yeah. You don't want to feel badly about, I, and, and, and that's such a weird thing because like in our shows, uh, the mystery cafe shows, obviously, you know, there's going to be, well, usually there's a murder. So usually there's a murderer. Uh, so clearly not everybody gets along yeah. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> And yet, you know, it's like, well, I don't want to make anybody unlikable. So you know, it's just finding that way to, you know. Um, but other than that, uh, for myself, uh, Peter Sellers, Phil Hartman, and uh, Phil Silvers. Yeah. I yeah. Say. I don't think I knew that about the Phil Silvers. I didn't know about the Muppets. And I, you told me a story one time about being in Los Angeles because, you, you know, you're traveling and, and going to uh, karaoke. Mm -hmm. And, of course, karaoke in – LA if you don't live in LA oh people take God. very seriously because they oh yeah they never know who's going to be in the audience that's right and so they do they take it it's almost like an audition oh, and you got singing up, singing scales out yeah. on the street like the, oh. yeah like practicing and really yeah. you know and around here I live in San Diego here you know it's a fun thing people get drunk yeah. and they go to karaoke Right. Um, That's what we do in Minneapolis. Right. It's a musical theater thing or whatever. People just, sure. or people like to sing and get up and, oh, yeah. let's go to Korea. You got up in the middle of LA, in the middle of all this serious pretension <laughs> and sang Rainbow Connection, but not just as you, uh, but as Kermit. In the, in the voice of Kermit the Frog. And it was, it just was funny. It's, it's like, it was all Whitney Houston, Elton John, right. you know, and the, like and things, our, things that would, you know, demonstrate the vocal ability and it was boring as hell mm -hmm. like nobody did anything fun you know nobody went yeah. up and did you know, just a gigolo or right you know i will survive or anything right. like that it was all these ballady crap and i had put my name in and it was i was assuming it was never going to come up because the host knew everybody it's like oh i'll put you up for you know so, oh well i'm never going to get in but then he called me up and it was hilarious because the other thing about it is that and this is very LA is that, you know, whoever was singing, nobody was paying any attention. They're, they're talking to each other. Like nobody's watching what's going on with the karaoke. So it was just kind of sad. It's like, you know, people yeah. who are like putting so much into it and performing and nobody's watching. Them. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I got up there and, uh, and I actually, I, I, I don't think it was, um, 
It was oh, it's, rainbow it's connection. not it was easy being, being green. green. Right. Yeah, because it starts with the spoken part. And right. so I got up there and I said, hi, oh, Kermit the Frog here. And uh, today I'd like to tell you about the color green. Uh, because I'm green and, uh, well, you know, and it's whatever the, whatever the <laughs> lines are. And I, and just people kind of turning, you know, it's like, it's not <laughs> green and green. And at the end of it, like people just went nuts and it was like, well, see, that's, you know, breath of fresh air. That's the, that's the entertainer in you. You, you told like, me the bartender was like, just ecstatic. Oh yeah. Like, I didn't he was like, oh, it was <laughs> God, nice, dude. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so sick there of every yeah. night listening to that. And, so, yeah. yeah, it was funny. I so forgot you, about that. You've pretty much had, you know, this wonderful journey of being a, an entertainer. I mean, that's essentially. Am, am you... I dying? No. <laughs> no. I hope you've not. had this wonderful journey, but I'm sorry to have to it's, tell you. I'm sorry it's over. What? What? No, I mean, it's it makes I you think about hopes. what's next, you know, because everything has kind of been so different and so uh, full of just the energy that you bring and and uh i i you know you're doing mystery cafe do you see yourself doing something beyond that and and if so what is what do you think that might be yeah or do you know um, well i i don't know but here's what i do know um and and i think about this all the time is like so often when you're in pursuit of something and it's, it, and it's great. It, it, you know, it's great when people have a specific, it's like, I want to be this and I want to do this and I'm going to study to do this and I'm going to pursue this. But I think sometimes when you do that, uh, you know, you close off other avenues and a perfect example is the St. Paul saints. The reason that came about is because our organist uh, also plays keyboards for comedy sports and he knew me. And he says, hey, they're looking for, uh, well, actually, what they, they were looking for a new PA. Uh, and I knew that I, that was not me because I didn't know enough about sports to be able to call the batters. But I was like, but I could, I could get you the guy that, that yeah. would do that. And I actually sold them on the idea of, uh, of an entertainment director because they had all this talent out there that was just kind of independently hired yeah. and dealing with, ma can you imagine like an entertainer dealing with sports management one-on-one? -on -one? And like what that communication process right. must be. Yeah. So I told them, I said, here's you, you want to do what? Yeah. I said, here's what I think you need. I think you need somebody to kind of be, you know, right. direct the team and, yeah. and hire your PA. And I said, I think you should have a PA team. I think two people talking back and forth is going to be much more interesting than one guy on the microphone throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And, and uh, so my friend Rita Borsma, who is one of the greatest uh, improvisers I know. So Rita and uh, Nicholas Lehman and Lee Adams in, in a rotation. Yeah. Um, and, and just, you know, but I, but I never would have thought of myself as working for a professional sports organization because I don't know yeah. anything about sports. Yeah. Right. Um, and certainly when they came to me and said, you know, we're, we're looking for a new PA, I, I would have said to myself, well, you're looking for the wrong, I'm not your guy. Yeah. But sometimes you go, but maybe, but maybe this though, you know? Yeah. yeah. And so lots of opportunities have come up that way where, where it's not exactly what I was looking for, but you know, you know, and it becomes a tremendous opportunity. A mm -hmm. uh, triple espresso was that too. I, I thought of myself as a homebody yeah. and then I took a chance on triple espresso and found out I, I love being on the road. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. I love being on the road. I, it's funny. I, I actually, the same thing for me. I mean, it came at an interesting time, but I, I, I actually met Bill Arnold at Christopher Hart's birthday party. And we talked and I didn't remember this till years later that that's who it was. Cause we sort of cross referenced and went, Oh, you're right. That part. You're the guy I talked to. Cause I talked to some guy that was in San Diego doing triple something whatever that show was called and i remember thinking about it going i would never do that because i had my own thing that i was doing and right. years later of course here i was um so that's very funny yeah and what's the wildest thing that you ever did uh for the saints what's the because you told me about some of the stuff you did it was kind of out there what's well the the, my favorite one? my favorite what's is the, favorite? the uh, so there had been a, a group the um uh, uh, Minnesota Atheist Society. <laughs> uh, and they wanted to kind of, they, uh, you know, they wanted to let people know, it's like, we're not Satan worshipers, we're atheists. We, right. you know, and we do charitable work and we're nice people. And, you know, but 
people hear atheist a lot, a lot of people hear atheists and they kind of go, Oh, well, you know, and, um, so they sponsored one of our nights. We were having atheist night. And so the saints became the ain'ts. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we covered up the S on all of the signage. Uh, and I was trying to think of like ways to, to acknowledge the atheist thing while also keeping in mind that our general crowd, it's a family crowd and they might bristle at some of this stuff. So I came up with this idea called the atheist race. And what I did was um, there were, I had a couple that I had wrapped in cellophane. So side by side wrapped in cellophane. Um, I had a big uh, uh, crash symbol, a slip and slide oh. and two giant monkey heads. And what I said was, okay, here's how it works. It starts with the big bang. Now you hit the crash symbol and then the two of you are going to divide, you know, cellular, <laughs> break apart from the cellophane. Then you're going to make your way through the primordial ooze, which was the, you know, the slip, and, slip slide. and slide. And then you're going to evolve and race to the finish line where you put on the monkey head and you go. So I explained the rules and we only have a minute and a half on the field, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, so it starts with the, the big bang and then two of them are, ah, and they get out of the cellophane and then they dive through the slip and slide and they're soaking wet and they put on the monkey heads and they're running and they're running for the finish line and they're running and they're looking around and I'm like, yeah, yeah. Hey, um, just so you know, uh, this is an atheist race. So there's no real finish when you're done, you're done. And there's no reward. <laughs> and the audience got a big chuckle out of that. And the two of them with the monkey heads and wet, they just kind of walk off. And it was, kind of like that. So that was, that was one of my favorites. That was a, that was one of the, the bigger laughs, but yeah, I mean, every, every game is a different theme. So we'd have, you know, star Wars night or um, Lord of the Rings night or whatever. And I'd bring out local, uh, uh, you know, Comic-Con type cosplayers. Yeah, sure. And, you know, dress the theme and come up with trivia games for each. I, but I, th we have 50, 50 home games in a season. And I thought of it as like trying to produce, you know, 50 games in a, or 50 shows in a summer. Just, yeah. You know. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot of different stuff to come up with. That's, that's great. That's why I stepped down after five years. <laughs> yeah. I bought, I bought the company. I was like, I can't do that. I told uh, Hannah, my girlfriend, uh, you know, I was like, okay, you know, the saints, I'm a crazy person. Mystery cafe. I'm a crazy person. You know, if I do it year round, you, that all I am is crazy and you right. can't, you know, yeah. so I need to, yeah. you know, at yeah. least a season where I'm not. Cause you're kind of off. I mean, off stage, you're kind of pretty normal. I mean, somewhat, Thank you, you know, <laughs> I mean, we can, you can go places. Do you get recognized in Minneapolis? Do people recognize oh, occasionally. you? Occasionally. Yeah. But only very occasionally. Yeah. As, I mean, Mostly been, there's, a, there's a commercial that's been running for, 15 years where it's an organ <laughs> organ donation thing and it's all face acting and it's all me and they they run it at the dmv uh because -huh. uh, the thing is because the 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 commercial is set at the dmv right and so it's on a loop at every dmv oh, in minnesota and so and it has been for like what did i say 12 years like 12 or 13 years yeah and so yeah i get recognized for that Wow. Like, oh, great. That's how I'm going to be remembered. I'm the guy <laughs> right. who gave, gave away his kidney or something. You know? Right. Exactly. Um, but yeah, occasionally, you know, That's fun. or That's triple fun. espresso. Hey, do the gorilla. Yeah. I'm not going to do the gorilla here in the mall. Right. But thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> if you couldn't be a performer, mm -hmm. if for some reason you were not able to do that or be an entertainer, what do you think you'd be doing? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, it would have to be something creative. Um, and I don't know if this is a, you know, if you would consider like advertising as entertaining or, yeah. um, you know, or, or writing. I mean, I, I, I honestly don't know. And it's an interesting question because at the moment, uh, you know, pandemic being what it is everything i do requires an audience and i don't have an audience right, right now so right uh finding new new ways to um uh you know get that creative fix yeah. is, you know, yeah. is a thing i've thought about advertising as well i mean that's a that's a definitely a creative outlet and, mm. and the way and i think it's just the way entertainers minds are wired you know that the, they would tend to think of things a certain way see yeah. things a little bit differently 
Uh, so yeah. I don't know if you if 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 you feel this way, but because you're you're a talented guy on many fronts. Thank I you. mean, you're a director and a, a writer and an actor and a magician. I mean, yeah. you one would say of you, you wear many hats, <laughs> you know. Hats. And I kind of get a lot of the same thing because you know it's like. Uh, you know, I can build puppets. I can, I'm, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, I write and I perform. And one might also say, oh, you wear many hats or you have different, all these different skills. And I, yeah. I think of it as really being one skill, which is I can conceive of a thing and I can actualize it. Yeah. You know, yeah. and to me, it's like writing a funny line is so similar to, uh, you know, drawing a picture uh, or delivering a line on stage. Yeah. It's all the same thing. It's like, how is it going to read? How is it, you know, and just being able to kind of visualize that, yeah. you know? So as far as that's concerned, uh, you know, the, whatever would have that application. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. No. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Yeah. So, I mean, you might actually be like a, a painter or something else along those lines. Something creative is definitely uh, where that would go. I yeah. agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I try to keep my thrust, you know, I do wear a lot of hats, but I try to keep my thrust as being like just an actor or director so that people, because you start wearing too many hats, people get very confused about what do you what do you do <laughs> you know where are yeah. you going so yeah. so sometimes I, I keep love quiet. I would love to get into uh, uh, children's books to be honest mm -hmm. yeah because um, I, I again you know having written for uh, uh, the clown back mm -hmm. in the day like I love writing for kids um, and I've actually written a couple children's books I just haven't done anything with them you know yeah it's been kind of an idea and I you mentioned a friend oh I'm sorry go ahead Oh no! I had had a friend. His daughter, um, his daughter had to have glasses, and mm -hmm. at a very very young age, mm -hmm. and so of course she's the only one in her class with glasses, and it was, uh, you know, obviously kind of she felt self conscious, and my friend said, you know, do, would you mind like I don't know writing a little story or something that you know might kind of, and so I wrote this story, um, uh, called the uh, the princess the princess in glasses and. Uh, uh, it's it's a cute little thing where it's you know pr princess iris and she's visited by her fairy op 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 optometrist you know and like uh but it, it's it's a cute it's a cute story i love that kind of thing anyway you should put it out you know people do that and they put stuff on amazon for free but, and create yeah. a following so well, that's true yeah. yeah it was her it was her favorite book for like a month uh, and then of course you know, forget yeah. all about it but exactly <laughs> exactly uh so would you have any advice for a young person that's thinking of pursuing either like a career in entertainment or as a stand-up comedian or, uh, you know, yeah. I running would say mystery just, cafe? The, 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 the short answer is as far as advice goes, and this just sounds so stupid, but it's like, just do it. Yeah. Just do it. Um, imp improv is an especially good way to start. Mm -hmm. I think you, uh, it, it opens you up to, um, a lot of different kind of kinds of, you know, ways of thinking and, yeah. and, and you meet a lot of people really quickly, yeah. you know, anytime we were on the road, you know, I mean, there's only three of us in the cast, you know, and like, it's like the three of us and a stage manager mm -hmm. and that's it. And if you yep. relied only on that for your social life for months on, you know, yeah. when you're in a, in a city, mm -hmm. uh, you know, especially if you're with guys who well, I kind of do my own thing or what, you know, yeah. you know, so the first thing I would always do is I would go and find the, uh, the improv in town. Yep. Yeah. You did and that. No in matter, you did that yeah. in Pittsburgh and you guys, yeah. we went, oh I went God. to a couple of those. We went to the, they were in like a, like this sort of almost basement and yeah. all the, all the buildings. If you've never been to Pittsburgh, it's, they're all like, you know, they all seem like the buildings are like 400 years old. They're not, but they yeah. feel like they're 400 years old. In fact, the building that we, we weren't in that particular building, but we were in a, near the, a building, near the building where they shot Silence of the Lambs, where uh, Jody Foster goes to visit uh, Anthony Hopkins as Hannibal Lecter. Oh, sure. That was like across the street. So it had that kind of that dark brick and that feel. Uh, that's where you were doing improv. But yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah. But you, you always they do had, that. You always connected with local improv people. and They had two yeah. improv jams a week. And, yeah. uh, you know, if you, if, 
I did the same thing in Sacramento and, and uh, they had a comedy sports there. They invited me to play on the first day. Yeah. And, and you know, you, you find that you, you speak the same language. I mean, it's, it's, you know, those people, I mean, improvisers are very, very similar wherever you go. Yeah. And so you've got like 13 people who are like, Hey, come to rehearsal right. or let me, let me take you to this place or let me show you what you got to see while you're here is this and this and this. So improv is not, not only is it a good uh, inroad if you're, looking to get involved in comedy, but it's a really good place to meet like-minded people yeah. who inspire you oftentimes who might be, uh, you know, somebody that you end up teaming up with and building a team yeah. uh, or, you know, cause collaboration is, is big for me personally. I, I, I've, I say I've written a number of shows. Uh, I should really amend that. I've co-written a lot of shows. Uh, when I'm writing a mystery cafe show, it's like, I'll come up with the concepts and, whatever, but then I choose my writing partner uh, who would be appropriate for the theme and trusting, you know? Yeah. Cause I, I just think it's, it's more effective. It's uh, you're bouncing ideas off each other. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, at, when it, when it's at its best, and, and I can say this about like the last two, three shows that I did, you'll come across a line or two where you're like, I don't remember who wrote that line. I don't remember right. which one of yeah. us did it, That's you know, right. but yeah. Um, and then stand up, uh, similarly, there's open mic nights and yeah. you yeah. just watching people and, you know, getting to know them and, you know, all of us have advice for each other, mm -hmm. you know, but I'm hearing from you that like, uh, whether it's conscious or subconsciously is, is networking as much as you're kind of like being kind of like a homebody that you network because you, every, our conversation has involved you talking, you've connected with friends and that's a lot of my career is I would not have been led to certain things that ended up being this big thing in my life if I had been closed off to it and being open to opportunities yeah. and, and being allow, allowing yourself to being drawn and not in a way that you like, I, I don't know that I've never done this before, but I'm going to go off and try this. And that's uh I think taking those risks is real important too. And that sounds like a lot of what you've done. So what, one last thing, what inspires yeah. you? I know you're a big music guy. Uh, oh, I yeah. know you love music and mm -hmm. I know you have a lot of favorites. Like I know the jazz butchers is like one of your number one. I don't like, know if you can uh, see <laughs> every poster here, literally yeah. every poster here. I could do a pan of the yeah. room. I know that uh, yeah, that is they're, a big, they're big, big favorite uh yes. but i know you have a lot of other things that inspire what inspires you do you have like a thing that inspires you or what gets you going creatively what i think is funny is um really really good shows and really really bad shows those are the yeah. things that inspire me when when i go to see a really really good show i go god i i want i want to do like something that good i yeah. saw a production of the miser in uh in London and it was just on a whim. We, we, huh. uh, we were, we were there on vacation and whatever our plan was, didn't work out. And, and it was playing. I was like, Oh, well let's, you know, and it was uh, Lee Mack and uh, 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 what's his name? Oh God. He was on the young ones. But anyway, it was, it was tremendous. It was huh. farcical and it was great. And I watched it and it's nothing like the kind of stuff I do, but I was like, but I want to capture that kind of, uh, comedic, just j big ballistic, yeah. you know, yeah. and then terrible shows where you watch a show and you go, I could poop a better show than that, you know, <laughs> inspires me too. Cause it's like, you know what, <laughs> maybe I'm too hard on myself sometimes, right. with, yeah. you know, yeah. you know, yeah. um, yeah. You are bigger than life. That's another thing about you on stage is that you're, there's something about like, uh, just your presence. I mean, uh, you know, people talk about people having a presence on stage and if you just walk out, you know, if you're just there, there's, a, I mean, you're a big guy, but you're also, there's a presence. There's, there's a, a lot of, yeah. There's I, I blame my about. mother. I, I have, <laughs> I have my mother's expressive face. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there's, yeah. I, I mean, little kids love, I, I'm not particularly kids. I don't know. Yeah. But like, they love me because I'm a big, dumb cartoon character, like in life, sure. mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah so. that's funny and and lastly do you have a favorite role that you've played or a favorite thing that you've done in your in your entertainment world 
Well, I, I got to say, and maybe it's just because it was the longest and run and the, you know, kind of provided the most opportunity, but, but triple espresso. I mean, not only was the role, uh, I remember when I watched it and I, and I'm, you know, I'm watching the gorilla impression and it's all this, this pantomime, you know, st stuff. And I'm looking at that. I'm like, well, I, I'm built for that. I'm practically a silver black back gorilla. I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> um, and like the, the, you know, the guitar bit, you know, uh, I was like, Oh, well, that's, that's comedy. I can do that. I could do that. I'll have to learn how to play guitar, but I can do that. And then when I saw the shadow puppets, I was like, I have to do this show. Like I have to do this show. And so it was, it was equal parts stuff that I knew I was already going to, you know, have in my wheelhouse, yeah. but then also a bunch of stuff that I was going to have to figure out how to do. And yeah. I love that kind of challenge. Yeah. So, so that was, that was really great. And, and in terms of the science of comedy, when you're doing, when you're talking about like nearly 2000 shows, it's not, and people ask, they're like, how do you not, get bored with it you know yeah. and it's because i'm not trying to do the same thing night after night i'm not uh, it's it's not the same thing right it, it's it uh, again it's like baseball you know yeah. you get up to bat every time mm -hmm. you, you you know you got to decide it's like am i hit am i gonna you know everything's different am i yeah. yeah it's it's different every time you you yeah. step up and uh yeah, I mean, I just, it's like the science of comedy. It's, it's That's a really good analogy. I never thought of that because I get to ask, ask that because people always yeah. like their jaws drop when I tell them I did it for pretty much four years running, like without a break, you know. Right. So, so consistently. Like any, and, and they go, how did you do that? And it is like baseball because you still get up and you want to hit the ball, but the wind is different. The guy throwing the ball is different. Yep. You're in a different park. You're wearing different clothes. Yep. Your pitch, the catcher's, you know, everything is different. So it has a completely different feel to it, but it's the same thing. You're still in a baseball diamond. And, and the audience is the X factor every time. Always, and there's, yeah. Yeah. you know, the, the, the thing that, that occurs to me is that like in improv, you get one opportunity to, you know, to do whatever it is you're doing. Right. And, uh, you know, and I mean, if you're, if you're funny, you're funny and you know, it'll kill and that's great. But from a sort of, um, you know, a, a studious mind approach to comedy, having a thousand or more opportunities to deliver the same line, yeah. you start understanding things like the importance of cadence, mm -hmm. you know, how does it fall on the ear? Right. Uh, I, there was a line, I don't know if you remember this, but, and it's a dumb line. It doesn't, <laughs> it, but uh, where he's, where my character is talking about, uh, you know, he says, I didn't test well either. So the audience members saying, "I got you may this may be surprising, but I didn't test well either." Right. And then he turns and he says to the crowd, "He says, they tell you to use a number two pencil. They mean it." <laughs> and that's the joke. But right, I was saying, um, "Boy, they tell you to use a number two pencil. They mean it." And Bill Arnold comes up to me. He's like, "You keep saying, you know, boy, before you know what you're saying, and it doesn't change the intention." the difference between boy, they tell you to use a number two pencil and they tell you to use a number two pencil. There's, there's no difference in the intention, right? But the way it falls on the ear and the economy of words, it was twice the laugh. Yeah. It's amazing. It was just how, that one word change. Yeah. yeah. It is amazing. Changing from something that <laughs> small. I had a, I had a similar moment in a show called skin deep where I took like the longest pause ever to deliver the punchline. It was, mm -hmm. uh, uh, I want to grow old with you or something, you know, if you will just get on with it because she was addicted to plastic surgery, you know, mm -hmm. and I just started holding longer and longer and longer. And I, I would play with it every night. And, and it, the longer I held, the more they laughed. Yeah. So I would, I would divide the line. I would say, you know, uh, I forget exactly what the line is, but it's basically, you know, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. I want, I want us to grow old together if you will just get on with it, you know, and, uh, and they have a big laugh, but yeah, just the, the idea of just stretching that out, like to the point of almost nervousness on the other part of the actor going, did he drop a line? So, right. Yeah. And just uh, playing with things. It's so fun to do that and start picking it apart, but not at the detriment of the show. No, never. 
you know, not at the detriment of the jokes and the show and what you're the storytelling, but yeah. Yeah. It's like those Harvey Corman, Tim Conway moments, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, like I don't, I, I don't know anything about surfing. I've never surfed or anything, but I have to imagine that it's probably like you, 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 it's probably easier to do like the bigger, the, the wave is, you know, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? And like when people are laughing like that, you know, sometimes you can hold and, you know, be expressive. And so for example, my character being pretty dim witted, you know, um, I would say something in all seriousness and people would laugh and I had to figure out, you know, well, what would my response be if everybody's laughing at what I just said? And I don't know that what I said was in any way funny, you know, as a character, yeah. what I always took it as is, is they're agreeing with me, what I just said. So I would always interpret it that way. So as they're laughing, I'm like, right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. And that oh, fits yeah. with your character. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, yeah. And so like I would do that and I could sometimes just have that going for like a couple of minutes, you know, or, yeah. you know, or not a couple of minutes, but like, you know, a good like 30 seconds. And sometimes when it goes that long, you know, you look at the other actors and then you start to break because like we're all, you know, and I love when that happens naturally, mm -hmm. <laughs> not when uh, it's manufactured, but yeah. when you have those honest moments where we can all just uh, as a group, yeah. That was another thing about Triple Espresso that was so unique for those who've never seen it is that the entire, there is no fourth wall. Right. The entire thing is delivered to and for the audience. And I, it's really, in that way, it's really, really clever in that they have to cast the audience in a role. So the yes. audience is, are the college freshmen at the orientation. They are the attendees at the coffee house. They are the, what was the, the Kiwanis Club? <laughs> yeah, Kiwanis Club and yeah, on and on and on. And and yeah, yeah the whole show is delivered straight to the audience Which and I just and convincing them as well. You know, because every right. each one of the characters has their own viewpoint. Uh, you know, like I always described it as, you know, Buzz is like it was horrible. And Bobby was like, it was It was great. the greatest time of our <laughs> lives. And and, and he was and like, like it, it, it was okay, it could have gone better. <laughs> yeah trying to marry the two and uh right. that's that's pretty much it yeah so i remember one time yeah. uh, the only time i think i ever cracked up on stage was where it was visible uh was with you and paul and it was in minneapolis and i don't remember what happened but we were all trying to hold it together and then it was just laughing and then the audience was laughing and then you were laughing and they were looking at me because i hadn't broken yet and then i started to break and i had to turn around and the whole audience broke again and we all started yeah. breaking again and it was like it added five minutes to the show <laughs> Yeah, but Mystery Cafe similarly is, you know, the audience is present. We perform, we don't perform on a stage. We perform in and among the audience, as you well know. Right. And so in the same way, they're always there. And that, that is really, uh, that's such a great kind of performing because it just, it just acknowledges that we're all together, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what a time to talk yeah. about togetherness, togetherness. than right great. now. That's right. See, we're bringing it all back together. We're bringing it all back. I can't wait until we can have interactive theater again because yeah. uh, interaction is is uh, very much missed. Yeah, very much so. Any parting words? We'll end on that note. Parting words? Again, am I dying? <laughs> um, I, I, I tell Hannah, I said, on my tombstone, here's what I want. I wanted to say, Brian Kelly, he meant well. That's it. <laughs> he meant well. <laughs> oh man <laughs> maybe it didn't all work out the way it should. right no, i don't i don't i don't know other than thank you thank you for uh having me on your your show and oh uh, no thank you it was great um, and yeah. i i found out some stuff i you know i knew some of this some of this i didn't mm -hmm. know it was great and i and i wanted other people to know like some of your journey and and uh My and journey. influences and and maybe people pick up some wisdom from uh uh, all of our mistakes. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Good luck. Pick up any wisdom. To you. That's right. Anyway, Man, this this has been a cautionary tale. Thank That's you. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. Brian, thank you for coming on. Uh, oh, this has so been much. Brian Kelly. Uh, this has been Stage Perspective. My name is Charles Peters. If you like this video, please like the video and uh, please subscribe to the channel to get notified of new videos coming up. We got some great other guests coming up and uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you.